Welcome to Cinematic Excrement and my ongoing quest to review every Razzie Worst Picture winner. It looks like this country is slowly returning to something that resembles normal now that more people are getting their COVID-19 vaccines. And oh, what glorious timing. While healthcare officials are stressing the importance of vaccination, I get to shit all over Jenny McCarthy. Ah, good old Jenny McCarthy, a woman who managed to be famous throughout the 1990s and early aughts despite, as far as I can tell, never really doing anything noteworthy apart from co-hosting an MTV dating show with fellow problematic celebrity Chris Hardwick and looking good naked. She also became the face of the anti-vaxxer movement after her son was diagnosed with autism and she bought into the since-debunked study, and I use the term study loosely, by disgraced former physician Andrew Wakefield because she's a stupid, ignorant, lobotomized crap puddle. She also later claimed her son was somehow cured of autism through chelation therapy, even though experts have concluded this is impossible because there is no cure for autism, you sentient vial of anal seepage. But what experts think is possible is her son may have have been misdiagnosed with autism in the first place, which makes her anti-vaxxer stance even more ridiculous. I never thought the day would come when I would have sympathy for Ken Jeong, but my god, I feel bad for him for having to work with Jenny on The Masked Singer. What must that even feel like? Dr. Ken wasn't just the name of his short-lived sitcom. He is an actual licensed physician, and he has to sit next to an anti-vaxxer who may very well have contributed to the suffering of thousands of innocent children. I wouldn't think he could even stand to be in the same room as that woman, but you never know by looking at him. You know what? I take back every bad thing I ever said about his acting. If he can convince me that he is okay working next to Jenny freaking McCarthy, Laurence Olivier ain't got nothing on him. Oh, and in 2005, McCarthy starred in a terrible movie called Dirty Love. I guess that's what I'm actually here to talk about, so let's talk about it. Dirty Love was also written by this brain-dead bimbo and directed by her husband at the time, John Mallory Asher. They broke up around the same time the movie was released. Coincidence? I mean, yeah, probably. Or is it? Yeah, yeah, I, I, I'm sure it is. Or is The movie was only released in 44 theaters for two weeks, which is kind of sad. I think there are more than 44 theaters in the Bay Area alone, and it made just over $36,000. It was lambasted by critics. Roger Ebert even gave it zero stars, though it was not the only Worst Picture nominee to receive that rating. More on that later. And it took home four Razzies, Worst Actress and Worst Screenplay for McCarthy, Worst Director for Asher, and Worst Picture. It was the only film that year to take home multiple awards, which is a little surprising as it was not the film with the most nominations. More on that later. And this was one of those rare occasions when Razzie voters actually chose a movie that was pretty far removed from the mainstream. The official press release even referred to Dirty Love as a little stinker that no one but they even seemed to know existed. And for all intents and purposes, I think they're still the only people who know this movie exists. It's not streaming anywhere. Netflix doesn't have the DVD. To review this movie, I had to resort to buying a used copy on eBay. And I think it was labeled used on a technicality because this disc is in pristine condition. If anybody watched this, I'm pretty sure they only did so once, which is totally understandable. I don't know how the Razzie voters found out about this movie, but they did, and they hated it. So let's find out why. Oh my God. Oh my God. Okay, so the movie begins with- Oh, oh my God. Not done. Yeah, so what's happening here? Oh what the god! hell? Oh my god! Oh my god! Oh my god! So McCarthy plays a woman who is referred to in the movie as Rebecca Summers, though the credits at the end list her as Rebecca Parker. In any case, Rebecca What's-Her-Name had fallen madly in love with this guy named Richard, thinking he was the one. And then she caught him in bed with another woman. This confuses me, and I'll tell you why. The poster for Dirty Love features the tagline, Got Dumped? Now, I get the reference. It's a spoof of the Got Milk ads. That's not the confusing part. What confuses me is... 
she didn't get dumped. She caught her boyfriend cheating on her, and she dumped him. This movie's tagline makes no sense. Anyway, after she catches her boyfriend in the act and proceeds to, you know... Yeah, that. She stumbles upon a fortune teller played by Kathy Griffin, and even though Kathy is a self-described D-list celebrity, this still feels beneath her. She tells Rebecca that she sees a white pony in her future, but there are some lessons she must learn before she meets her white pony. Lessons? What kind of lessons? That's a very good question. I wonder if the movie will ever answer that question. And what follows over the next 90 minutes or so barely qualifies as a movie. It doesn't really have a plot to speak of, really it's just a sequence of events. Rebecca goes on dates with several guys who should probably be locked up for the betterment of society, and more than one of these dates involves the guy putting something into or taking something out of his ass. I'm not saying Jenny has an unhealthy obsession with butt stuff, but I'm sure as hell implying it. And throughout the film, she somehow keeps running into her ex-boyfriend, Richard. They live in Los Angeles. There are almost 4 million people in Los Angeles. How do they keep running into each other? And when she spots her ex, Rebecca tries to make him jealous, which inevitably backfires because, as previously stated, she keeps going on dates with guys who should probably be locked up for the betterment of society. The one that stands out the most is her date with the magician because A, it goes on way too long, and B, it's confusing as hell because the movie can't seem to decide if magic is real or not. There's a moment where he starts levitating her chair in the middle of a restaurant, which he would not be able to do unless we're going on the assumption that magic is actually real, but then he tries to psychically call the waiter over, which doesn't work, and Rebecca has to call him over herself. Is magic real or not? Pick one. And that's pretty much the entire movie. She goes on dates, they end badly, rinse and repeat. Hard to believe this failed to capture enough interest to warrant being played in more than 44 theaters, isn't it? And when she's not going on terrible dates, Rebecca is doing her damnedest to gross out the audience. It would appear McCarthy has a penchant for gross out humor, except without the humor part. As evidenced by this line when she's considering a career in prostitution because reasons. Who cares if my vagina falls off from all the diseases out there? I'll take some open sores. Jenny, you are an open sore. There's also a bit where she goes to a supermarket to get some maxi pads, but she's a little too late and has her period right there in the feminine hygiene aisle. And somehow she ends up in a pool of blood so large that even Tarantino would tell her to tone it down. If you have so much blood coming out of you that it's starting to resemble the old Don Hertzfeld cartoon, Rejected, you're not on your period. You've ruptured something and you're dying. As for the characters, most of them don't even get proper introductions. They just kind of show up and suddenly they're in the movie. And in the case of Rebecca's parents, they only show up for one scene where Rebecca talks to her mom on the phone and... they exchange farts. Again, the stuff with the butts. Jenny, are you okay? That was rhetorical, I know the answer. Aside from the briefly appearing parents, we have Richard, played by Victor Webster, who is a total douchebag. So much so that I have to wonder how he and Rebecca ended up together in the first place. He even destroys her camera equipment after she catches him cheating on her, because infidelity didn't make him douchey enough, I guess. Oh, did I mention Rebecca is a professional photographer and he effectively just robbed her of her livelihood? How did their relationship even last long enough for her to think he was the one? Or was their relationship actually really short and she's just one of those idiots who believes in love at first sight or something? If any of my younger viewers have not yet figured this out, I'm sorry to be the bearer of bad news, but love at first sight is not real. Attraction at first sight is real, but that's not the same thing. And then we have Rebecca's friends. First, there's Carrie, played by Cam Heskin. She's terrible in this movie. I mean, really... Really terrible. This is one of the worst performances I have ever seen in my life. She's like an android who tried to learn human emotions by looking them up on Wikipedia. She's got a general idea of how they work, but she can't quite replicate an experience she's never had. And the ironic thing is her character is supposed to be an aspiring actress whose career is going nowhere because she's a really terrible actress, who goes to auditions run by people who don't know how to spell quiet. And if her acting was only bad in the audition scenes, that might actually be funny. But it's bad throughout the movie. Did John and Jenny just not explain the joke to her? What happened here? Then there's Michelle, played by Carmen Electra. And she is... 
How can I put this? You know how Iggy Azalea is white, but she sounds kind of... ethnic? I think she may have learned it from this movie. Oh, hell no! Nah. Now get a shit and let's go. I gotta call my baby daddy. Hey, girl. You still with us? I knew that should wake you up, girl. You've been sleeping for three days. Well, at least you can get some food stamps or something. Ooh, boy. This isn't the only character in the movie that's uncomfortable. There's a scene where Rebecca has a run-in with an Asian security guard at a grocery store who yells at her in broken English, which serves no purpose whatsoever except to say, hee hee, Asians talk funny. I can't believe someone made a movie this brazenly racist in 2005. And then there's a bit where Rebecca and Carrie go on a double date with two guys doing bad Woody Allen impressions. Well, we already have racism, might as well throw in anti-Semitism while we're at it. And while I do acknowledge the anti-Semitic nature of this scene, I will also point out that this continues Rebecca's trend of dating guys who should be locked up for the betterment of society. And as for Carmen Electra, I can't even say this didn't age well. This was dead on arrival. It's not funny, it's just awkward as hell watching her do... all of this. You know you're white, right? Hmm, I see your point, guy from Sum 41. Oh, yeah, Sum 41 is in this movie. Don't ask me why, not important. But the question is... Is she actually white? Because according to the credits at the end of the movie, Michelle's last name is Lopez. So we have Carmen Electra, a white lady, playing a Latina character who talks like a wannabe gangsta. About the only way this could possibly be worse is if she actually dropped the N-bomb, which I am honestly shocked she does not do. Finally, there's John, played by Eddie K. Thomas, and boy did he have a hell of a career in the early aughts. This was his second worst picture winner in five years. John, like many characters, shows up right the fuck out of nowhere, and I think he's supposed to be Michelle's roommate? And they live right next door to Rebecca, which they never actually establish until the very end of the movie. And there's this running gag where he keeps getting hit on by a tall lady played by Renee Albert, and if something about this looks off, that's because in reality they're the exact same height. I don't know if she's on stilts or he's on his knees, but it looks goofy as hell. Anyway, we eventually learn that John has an unrequited love for Rebecca, to which she is completely oblivious. And I can understand that because he gave absolutely no indication that he had a thing for Rebecca until out of nowhere he spelled it out for the audience. And you can probably guess where this is going. Why is she always going for guys who treat her like dirt instead of me when I actually care about her? <laughs> you know, your typical whiny Captain Friendzone bullshit. John, you can do better. You don't need to get hung up on this one woman. There are plenty of other women out there, and most of them have had their shots. But they do eventually end up together once Rebecca realizes John is wearing white pony brand shoes. Yeah, this is the payoff for that white pony thing. You're my white pony! Ooh, okay, Becky, could you bring it down a notch? And that's Dirty Love in a Nutshell. The story is crap, the acting is crap, it's not funny, it's racist as hell, and despite its 90-minute runtime, it's a chore to sit through. I don't know how the Razzie voters found this one, but I can see why they named it Worst Picture of 2005. And it is a bit refreshing to see them acknowledge a non-mainstream movie for once. But does that mean it was really the worst movie of the year? Well, if we look at the other nominees, we have The Dukes of Hazard, based on the TV show of the same name, which I thought was just... meh. Pretty much the only parts of the movie I found entertaining were the cameos from the members of Broken Lizard. We have House of Wax, a remake of the 1953 film with Vincent Price, for which Paris Hilton won Worst Supporting Actress. And I demand a recount! Yes, this movie was bad, and she was bad in it, but compared to Carmen Electra? Come on, that's not even close. We have Deuce Bigelow European Gigolo, a sequel no one was asking for. I hated this piece of shit. It's not funny, it's shockingly homophobic, and like Dirty Love, it relies way too much on gross-out humor. Except without the humor part. Also like Dirty Love, it received zero stars from Roger Ebert, and resulted in one of his more infamous reviews. Look it up, you'll thank me. And finally, we have what I think is the worst of Dirty Love's fellow nominees, Son of the Mask. Another sequel no one was asking for, especially a decade after the original and with no one from the original cast apart from a Ben Stein cameo in the opening scene. 
In lieu of Jim Carrey, we have Jamie Kennedy as cartoonist Tim Avery. Gee, I wonder who they're referencing with that name. The premise is Tim comes across the mask by chance, puts it on, performs a musical number that isn't bad but is nowhere near as memorable as Cuban Pete from the original, and then goes home and porks his wife while still wearing the mask. This apparently gives him magical mask semen, and their baby inherits the mask's powers, becoming the titular Son of the Mask. And boy did this movie suffer without Jim Carrey. Don't get me wrong, Kennedy can be funny. I've seen him do it. But he's no carry, especially here. He was just completely wrong for the parts. The movie also features the god Loki, played by Alan Cumming, and boy is it weird watching a movie based on a comic book featuring Loki, while as we speak, Disney Plus is airing a TV show based on a comic book featuring Loki. A very different sort of Loki, to be sure. Tom Hiddleston actually seems restrained compared to Alan Cumming in this movie, which is remarkable. Cumming is basically playing an evil version of the mask from the first movie, and he at least comes close to matching the energy of Jim Carrey. I dare say he was the best part of the movie. But despite his best efforts, this movie was in the toilet. Not only does it feature the creepiest CGI baby I've seen outside the Twilight Saga, but it's just lazy. Basically, they show the baby watching a bunch of old cartoons like Looney Tunes and the Flintstones, and then the baby and the dog, who also ends up wearing the mask and becoming a CGI abomination, reenact those very cartoons. Hell, the movie shows the classic cartoon One Froggy Evening almost in its entirety, and then proceeds to blatantly copy it. There's even a bit where the baby is singing the Michigan rag and Tim tries to show the baby to a neighbor, but the baby stops singing just before the neighbor opens the door. Get it? It's just like the cartoon, because we're unoriginal shit weasels who can't come up with our own material. I actually feel bad for the cast because there are some talented people here, but clearly none of that talent was in the writer's room. It's not funny, it's lazy, and I can't even call it derivative. Derivative would be one thing, but this just straight up copies others' work. And somehow, despite a scathing critical reception and eight nominations at that year's Razzies, more than any other film, it only managed to win Worst Remake or Sequel, going up against an almost identical list of nominees for Worst Picture, except Dirty Love, which is neither remake nor sequel. And so we come to the million dollar question. Did the Razzies get this one right? What was the real worst picture of 2005? This was honestly a tough one to answer. I went back and forth between Dirty Love and Son of the Mask for a while. I also briefly considered one of my previous review targets, Alone in the Dark. If you're not familiar, it's a video game adaptation from infamous German filmmaker Uwe Ball. Surprisingly, it sucks. And while it did get a couple of Razzie nominations, I'm shocked it wasn't considered for Worst Picture. In my opinion, it was far more deserving than Dukes of Hazard. But as bad as Alone in the Dark and Son of the Mask are, I think I have to stick with the Razzies on this one and go with Dirty Love. The other movies are bad, but this one felt like it actively hated me and wanted me to suffer. Mission accomplished, you piece of shit. If you haven't seen any of the films I've mentioned, Alone in the Dark is the only one I would recommend as it at least has some moments that are unintentionally hilarious. But don't bother with the rest of them. Especially Dirty Love, which is hard to find anyway, and should probably remain that way for the betterment of society. Next time, we return to the world of erotic thrillers. In the year 2006. Already I see a problem. Until then, I am the Smeghead, and Hollywood can suck it. Yeah. <laughs>